All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I know everyone's just getting into the session. We're excited for you to join us today. Um, we have a really, really interesting talk today about a timely subject and, and a good guest speaker. Um, in 2018, the US Supreme Court struck down the federal ban on sports betting outside of Nevada, which launched this massive wave of development in the market. To date, more than 20 states have legalized sports betting, including New York, Wyoming, just this week. Um, and that market has created huge amounts of opportunity for companies of all, 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 types, of, uh, all types of companies. The CDS is really excited to welcome BetMGM Chief Operating Officer Ryan Spoon to talk, to talk about this and other in his career. Ryan moved to BetMGM uh, this past year from ESPN where he's held several leadership positions focused on sort of digital products, social media, et cetera. Um, prior to that, he's held a number of roles in the technology sector as a venture uh, investor, going all the way back to his time uh, at college and at Duke University. Uh, we're really excited to welcome Ryan to Tuck. Um, I want to also point out thank you to our partners in the Tuck Alumni Engagement Office for partnering here and opening this up to our alumni network. Uh, welcome, alumni. Ryan, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, very much appreciate the time and the opportunity. Yeah. So, uh, quick starter: where where are you dialing in from? Where where are you currently located? Uh, so, I am in Central Connecticut. Um, ESP, you mentioned ESPN. ESPN is headquartered. If you're a big sports fan or you spend time watching or uh, TV, you probably hear them talk about in part. Uh, with pride and in part to make fun of it. Uh, the uh, headquarters, which is the majority of the company really is in Bristol, Connecticut, uh, dead smack in the middle. Um, and I live a little bit north of that. Uh, we've lived here, I was at ESPN for seven and a half years, almost eight. So we've, been, we've lived here for that long. Uh, however, we're moving to, uh, moving to New Jersey uh, come the end of the school year. So you know, a couple months. And New Jersey is the home of BetMGM, and uh, one of the first in major states to legalize. Uh, hence the the operation being there. Yeah, and and see, and you've been you've been home uh, working from home for quite a while now, I, I believe. I it's like everyone else. The last uh, at this point, it's like I, you know, it's it's really almost exactly thirteen months since not being in an office. Um, Sometimes it feels like a couple of weeks and sometimes it feels like a decade, yeah. uh, but every day kind of feels the same. Uh, so I've been in this seat for a long time um, and excited that it looks like some light is coming and in general. Uh, also, and we'll talk a little bit about this as we get into some of the BetMGM side, um, the company's remote at this point um, and because we've grown so fast, Many people like me have never been into the office, and many, you know, the actually the vast majority have never been into the office and never met everyone or anyone. Right? Uh, it's it's fascinating. The whole thing's fascinating, and that's true for all companies. But uh, it's worked and it's working. But I really miss the opportunity to go meet people. Yeah, I think we're. It's definitely an adjustment period. Hopefully, we'll be back in 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 person really soon. I think that you know, with things changing, it's, it seems to be on the horizon. So we're, we're excited. And our industry is a very, you know, yeah. very high touch kind of space. And, and I think um, it'll be good to get everyone in, in person. So, um, so, you know, you're the chief operating officer of BetMGM. How do you kind of describe what BetMGM is to people? I mean, it's for you, you've been in the role for a few months. Um, you know, how, how do, how was it described to you and sort of how do you kind of describe what, what BetMGM does to other folks? Yes. So, so I would give that, um, I, I think the explanation of what it does is pretty straightforward. Um, the description of the company is a little more um, nuanced and interesting, which I think then gives light into the next part, which is not just what we do, but how we do it and why I think we're special or, or uh, have the chance to um, uh, continue kind of our leadership position. Um, so, so we are a, a sports and gaming company. Um, and um, a lot of that is tied to uh, the mobile and mobile device and mobile app. Um, 
But we also, as I go through kind of our, the company's setup, uh, there's the physical side too. Um, so uh, when you go to the Bellagio um, and you go downstairs from your room, that's no longer the Bellagio Sportsbook, it's BetMGM. Uh, and so I, I give that example because two things. One, it kind of signifies the role of the digital plus the retail or physical. But second, and I'll get to the next point of the company a little bit, that demonstrates some of the uniqueness of our company, which is we are uh, a private company, which is uh, with kind of uh, two key equal investors, so two parents, if you will, one being MGM, an MGM uh, obviously renowned uh, uh, brand and experience and hospitality and you know so many great brands across the Strip in Vegas, but also the, the U.S. Um, and Intain, uh, formerly named GBC, and that is kind of the tech platform um, with massive footprint uh, globally and real scale. And so when you think about and. You know, I had the pleasure of working with Nick for, uh, I forget how many years, but a lot of years at ESPN. Um, and something we talked about all the time and I think is important in any venture that you work in, what can we do that no one else can do? That was kind of our mantra. And at, at a place like ESPN, it's probably heavily tied to video and, and uh, rights and analysis and perspective and opinion and, and quality. And here, I think it's very heavily the answer is um, the bridging of uh, those platforms, the ability to create really, because we, we are the tech, the leading experiences, the ability to um, create the same kind of uh, visceral and positive emotion that when you go into the Blasio or MGM or Mirage that you also feel when you go into our apps. Um, so long-winded answer, but um, um I think it's hopefully an okay one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I think it's 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 really exciting to see such an, a dynamic space kind of evolving really quickly. Um, for you, what has been really surprising as you've kind of come on board at, at BetMGM? You know, what's something? You know, what have you learned in the first six months on the job? So it hasn't been six months. Okay. So uh, <laughs> it's. it's uh, I think I think we're month four. Uh, oh, yeah. So um, first of all, it, it's it's remarkably complicated, uh, and so my learning is that I have a lot more to learn. Uh, <laughs> it's it's just a complicated uh, space, complicated business. Um, it's geographic, it's digital, it's physical. There's you know there's obviously a bunch of different components to it. Um, so one is you know it, it, there's a lot of components to it. Uh, the second is, and I knew this coming in, but it, I'm reminded every day, we are in the earliest of early innings. Uh, there is like the growth is incredible. There's so much opportunity. There's so much room to be better every day. There's so much room to uh, continue to drive growth and success. Um, and so that is both fun, but an education and also how you think about team and product and so forth. Um, and then there's also, there's a bunch of personal stuff you learn. Again, I, I mentioned just the growth of the company. When COVID started, we're something in the hundred to 150 people. We're now 550 or whatever that number is. So that huge chunk, including me and including people, uh, um, the majority of the team is new to the company. Uh, and has the same attraction that I do to the company, but also has not been to the office, has not met one another, is onboarding in this kind of environment. Uh, so there's a lot of personal learnings and organizational learnings and process learnings. Uh, it's, and by the way, that's not unique to BetMGM per se. The growth might be, but um, so there's a lot to learn and, and a lot to uncover, but it's all kind of uh, guided by the opportunity to continue uh, and accelerate growth and, and hopefully be great. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, as you mentioned, there's a lot of interest in this space. There's a lot of growth. It's fast, it's fast paced. Um, it's a, you're a digital business with, you know, with significant amounts of, of, uh, use, you know, users, data and information, 
lots of financial transactions taking place. How do you think about security in that environment? Um, you know, what is what has been sort of your approach there? I think if you think to the MGM kind of portion of the, the that that legacy, they're they, you know very famous for having incredible amounts of security in place, both physical and digital. Um, increasingly digital as the largest portion of that. Like, how do you think about that, and how much can you learn from them versus how much do you have to really kind of build it from scratch? So for, first, I mean, the, the really simple answer to your question is nothing is more important. Uh, and our definition of security is probably broader than a normal company's. Um, uh, uh, those in our space, ourselves included, there are a bunch of uh, components to security. There's also a bunch of components to uh, structures and, and legality and so forth. Uh, and some of that's driven by geography, some of that's driven by is it digital, is it physical? Uh, it is a huge component of what we do. Um, and I think the other point you made, which is uh, very pertinent and helpful, is MGM is world class at it, and Tain is world class at it. And so there's a lot that uh, in all of those components that we are able to uh, work together on. And then there's also a lot that we work together with the, you know, the regulators or the states. Uh, um, but I, I do believe there are kind of core principles or tenets that you have to be, you have to put as your North Star, you know, well ahead of all other decisions and things like uh, trust, things like um, uh, reliability, things like security and safety and protection um, those, those have to lead, um, before you get into some of the other decisions. I think it's, you know, it's something that I, that I think is increasingly a word, the, the word you use trust is something that, you know, has come up in every conversation we've had over the last two years at, in the center with every executive we've, we've mentioned, it seems to be, you know, so central to what, what's, you know, the digital space right now, you know, is your sense that the companies are, you know, this is more just you as a consumer out in the marketplace, that companies are starting to pay greater attention to that? Or, you know, are they still kind of missing the boat? Because it, I do think in your space, I think, uh, ironically, like casinos, you know, in the sector, in the gambling space, um, has always been actually, has been such a core tenant. You know, we're, we're just seeing a lot of companies try to figure it out. Yeah, I think, It's complicated. I think as a user, obviously the definitions of trust or of security change based on the product, based on the brand, based on um, really what the usage is, right? So think about we're in one space, e-commerce is a space, there might be content, there might be levels that aren't connected to a wallet or aren't connected to, uh, and so I just think the definition has to change. Then there's also you know, trust doesn't necessarily, interestingly for some, trust might not actually sit in that same concentric circle or the overlap might be smaller with something like security. Trust can actually be an emotional thing. It can be a, a soft element, but massively important to the brand or as any of us interact with friends or bosses or peers, right? Trust also has a soft side to it. Um, and I do think it's elevated from across any of any sector uh, for a bunch of reasons, particularly as we are all, um, you know, shifting habits entirely digital at this point uh, over the last year. But that was all well, that might have sped up. That's happening anyways, and that will continue to happen. Um, so I, I think everyone should be thinking about trust. Everyone should be thinking about security. Uh, they're obviously highly related, uh, particularly in a field where there are things like wallet and and gameplay and so forth. Yeah, I have a question about uh, NFTs and sort of your take on this. It's a topic that you know we've obviously been following a bit about and is very of, of great interest. You know, you know, with Top Shot NBA, you know, NBA Top Shot, you know, and Dapper Labs raising huge amounts of money this month. You know, or what last week or the week before. You know, this seems like a really interesting space. Is that something that you think about um, at, at MGM? Is that something that you maybe personally, given your kind of long kind of career in this in these this this intersection of kind of sports and technology and digital? Um, I imagine you have a perspective. What's your kind of take on NFTs and, and where that's headed? 
Um, so let me talk about it from a personal perspective. Sure. I'm a massive, I've gone way too deep into cards over, like, over the last couple of years, like to the point where um, it, it's now a family fight. Uh, like, cause you go to the mailbox and it's just eBay stuff and, and the PSA shipped me some stuff back. And uh, if I literally take that camera and span it over there, there's probably 200, 200 cards sitting in slabs. And I think you can see one or two back. Like I collect weird stuff too, as you can also tell um i have weird weird interest um so personally i already kind of, it already resonates with me i have bias um what i think is fascinating by the entire thing whether it's a physical card or it's one of these or it's cause um or it's a digital token it's an nft they're all driven in part by i think two things one is you have to like you have to enjoy it. There, like, a lot of my interest in in cards is, I think, when they're done well, they're beautiful. I like the art of it. I like the creation creativity of it. Um, there's certain cards that resonate with me. There's certain ones that don't. I think the Top Shot examples, and you know, in my prior life, we cut thousands and thousands, probably over my life, millions yeah. of videos, um, and highlights. There's an art to that. What makes the play great resonates not just because it was cut well, it was packaged well, but also the player. And what did he or she do? How did, right? There's an art to it that has to resonate. Um, the second is scarcity. What makes that card valuable? It's the only one in existence. And then the next one, there might be a one out of 10 and a one out of 50. And that one has a different variation. And then when you have a physical one and it has a PSA, well, the grade actually makes it scarce because now you cut the population. And that's what I think is really interesting about the NFT ones are you can still capture the art and the enjoyment, but you can also capture the scarcity very cleanly, actually, I would argue in a way that's more clear than the stuff that's behind me, because thanks to blockchain, you actually have all the ownership history. I think that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. To me, my personal attraction is where those things can sit together in the future, like in the middle. Um, I just have a, a natural affinity towards the physical side. I like to touch them. I like to see them. But I, I certainly understand the NFT side. I think, for, I think where that gets really interesting or bigger over time is when it's not just looked at as an investment, right? Because I think right now, a lot of that is on the how do I make money? but when it becomes not just the investment side, but satisfies some of the artistic or the collectible side, because that's, I think ultimately that is needed to sustain at a kind of, or, or to reach sustenance. So that's a good kind of place to transition to your time at ESPN. Um, By the way, did you know, I answer any of your NFT question or just talk yeah, about Yeah, no, that? I think I, I find it really interesting. Um, you know, blockchain's sort of been looking for that kind of, real heavy use case to drive a particular thing outside of a couple specific kind of to your point of investments. I think I think many of the crypto assets and using blockchain have been investments and there's certainly some some arguments to be made for some um, other blockchains for for in the industrial space and supply chain and others. I think the consumer space has been really looking for a non-investment vehicle kind of blockchain application and NFT yeah. seem to be kind of stepping into that void, which is really, to me, quite interesting. Now, both of our answers, I think we're very, I don't mean this negatively, they were selfish. They're from our perspective yeah. as a buyer or a, or what do I like is how I started. Mm -hmm. I actually think from the flip side, what I'm super excited about is if you are the creator, if you're the artist, there's actually a way, first of all, there's a really interesting mechanism to make money. And also for me to support the artists that I'm attracted to. Um, and I think that also, when that blends with the physical and digital, that I think that's like exceedingly interesting and healthy, as opposed to just saying, hey, is it, what's that card worth? How can I make more or less money on it? Um, which is nice if you make money, but I don't think is a sustained long-term piece. Yeah, I think, you know, if you look at the sort of the, what iTunes did to the music industry, you sort of see that disruption of that value chain um, further happening potentially with this kind of technology, right? Where the artists themselves could basically yeah. directly sell to consumers, directly license music or, or movies or whatever, without cutting so much of that value chain out is, 
is really an interesting possibility. It's still pretty f er, to your to your point about it, but it's still really early, right? I think oh, you're it's, like just dip dipping one toe into the water. Products, the technology's early. The products yeah. are. Yeah. So, so you have a, a really interesting background at ESPN. I'd love to hear a little bit more about sort of your time at ESPN and sort of leading kind of in the digital space at ESPN um, and that transition, as you mentioned, you know, over the last, you know, seven, eight years, ESPN has gone through significant transformation on the digital side. What was, what was that like? How, you know, how did you, how would you talk, you know, explain sort of like what that was like being inside ESPN going through that transition and helping lead some of that? Um, so first off, if you're a sports fan, there's no place better than ESPN. And, and um, I did not leave ESPN to leave ESPN. I left for a great opportunity. E ESPN is fabulous. The, and just like cards or other things, like we all in different ways have different nostalgia about what it means to us in different ways. Uh, and some of that probably changes based on how you grew up or what sport you like or age, whatever that might be, but it means something. And the other part is it means something at mass scale. Like the numbers for ESPN are mind boggling and they're not, and you know, Nick could actually articulate this better than anyone because this was his job in many ways. It's generally not superficial reach. There's real engagement, uh, which again, as you think about whatever job you have next or where you wanna be or so forth, I would caution always to think about not just how big at the top of a funnel or how big a company or the brand is, but what's it mean and what has it touched people? And I, I generally always take uh, depth of touch with smaller reach than uh, greater reach just superficially. Um, so obviously great place to be. Um, I was hired in to run product and uh, kind of two things I say about that uh one there wasn't a head of product before me uh which is good and bad uh and um so that kind of meant a lot of the vision was unifying products and experiences and trying to put some general vision or roadmap around that the second was in part because of that and other factors we had 40 we had over 40 apps on ios alone when i joined Literally, there was an app for college football. There's an app for scores. There's an app for news, an app for baseball, an app for X games. We had 40 plus apps. So to a user, that doesn't make a ton of sense. To our partners, that doesn't make a ton of sense. It also means you have crazy tech debt. Like every time iOS would have a new release, you had to, I mean, just chaos. Um, so we just consolidated and consolidated. And there's now one core ESPN app. It's the biggest sports app by a huge margin um and one fantasy app and that was uh, you know and by the way they've improved they do a ton of stream like all great but um um built a great team um and uh over the last three years a bunch of things happened um um in fact tech was centralized across disney uh which enabled a lot of good things disney plus espn plus all the like those major shifts um and i and, and nick joined me on this journey as well the uh um moved over and from the espn side led the digital side and so that was a ton of content creation um big social strategy and platform the monetization strategy and we thought a lot about a couple things like all folks in media uh in fact i assume everyone thinks about how do you reach new audiences how do you expand your footprint What's that mean from a business standpoint? So how do you make money on that? Um, and in our, like we had a motto in general, which we were fortunate to be able to have, which is if we can grow sports fandom, who benefits more from that than ESPN? Everyone benefits in the ecosystem, but ESPN has more sports than anyone. That So a lot of what we thought about was how do we drive excitement around sports? How do we drive excitement and fandom? How do we drive engagement around an ongoing event? Most cases, those events were on our air, but other cases they weren't. And we still had to be in that conversation. So it couldn't be totally, uh, right? We still had to 
drive excitement and engagement around March Madness, even though that's not something that exists on ESPN. Yeah. So, you know, the, the ecosystem obviously is going through significant transformation, right? As you mentioned, you alluded to ESPN plus, but many of the, you know, sort of leagues themselves are, are introducing their own programming, both, you know, kind of traditional kind of television linear programming, as well as kind of digital, you know, direct to consumer kind of content and programming, you know, how do you see that continue to evolve? Because it, you know, we've had, a, we have had a number of conversations over the years with sort of both the folks at ESPN, as well as places like Nielsen and others who see, hey, the, the unbundling will cost as much or more than the bundle, you know, yeah, there's some advantages, potentially there's some disadvantages around delivery via, via the, you know, I, internet versus cable. Like, how did you think about that as you were kind of lead, what, you know, what's your take on sort of where this is, where this is headed? So I have a really simple or simplistic answer to that. It's not simple. Like none of this is simple. It doesn't mean it's right either. Um, but I, I generally like to always take the point of view of what's the consumer? What's what, what in our, in, in ESPN's terminology, what's the fan's point of view? And the reality is users in any capacity are more powerful and empowered day by day. Um, and so whether we want to discuss that the best thing is a bundle, an unbundle, a rebundle, um, you have to be prepared for the scenario where you have to live in all those places. And this morning, I watched the Masters on my app via ESPN Plus uh, while I had YouTube TV running my, you know, watching ESPN First Take or whatever I was watching. And I'm on my computer doing, uh, getting scores, texts, Microsoft Teams, which is what we run on. Um, I think you had, and th this, uh, Nick helped prove this point on the content side again and again, you have to be in all places and understand and quantify what you're doing in those places, right? You're not just there to, to be there. Um, but I think that's the ultimate change that is occurring and will drive whatever future change, which is whether it's this device at five inches or a beautiful 60 inch TV, what's the best experience? How's the user tapping into that? Um, and how do you satisfy him or her there? The rest, you know, you can control what you, you can only control what you can control. The rest you have to prepare for. Um, but I, I do think in general, everyone is thinking about how do you reach the most users possible? That often means being in different places. How do you reach different sets of users, right? Ex our terminology was expand your audience. Well, guess what? To expand your audience, I generally believe you got to be in every all those locations again. You're not asking everyone to come to you. You got to think about how you move people across platforms, but you can't do that until you've gotten to that place. And then you got to think about once they're there, how do you keep them? And that generally means what's the best experience possible. Yeah. So, um, you know, you were still at ESPN in your role there at the start of COVID when all sports kind of shut down, right? ESPN, you know, HBO has got a, a, you know, a documentary out looking at that sort of the day that, you know, sports, sports went quiet, I forget the exact title. What was that like? How did you think about, okay, what are we going to do to pivot? How do we find content? As you've mentioned, I think content drives the heart of ESPN and, and companies like it. Um, what was that like? You know, we had Russell Wolf um, here, who's the, you know, the, uh, the president of ESPN plus he's a Tuck alum talking with uh, the Dean of the business school here, Matt Slaughter about that strategy a little bit and, and saying like, look, digital played a significant role in, in bridging that gap and thinking about it. What was that like for you? Where did you, how did you kind of bridge that, that early first few months of COVID? Uh, well, so, so I would I mean, this is what we lived every day for a while. The, uh, the first month, the first two months were a whole lot easier. <laughs> than, uh, in the early going, I will say there was a lot of storytelling to be done. I'm not, obviously we'd rather show games and highlights. I'm not, but explaining there was so much to figure out and understand and the ramifications of X, Y, Z, and then the personal side of that. And then, um, right there was so much storytelling and I still think to this day, 
there's interesting pieces there, right? Like look at the start of the baseball season, look at the NHL right now, look at, there's a bunch of interesting parts. Um, so bucket one is you got to cover it. You got to story tell it bucket two. And this is something um, that we had already started in a, um, um, that we had already been underway well before COVID, but it, that accelerated it is particularly on social, there has been a strong push by ESPN into, um, for lack of a better term, kind of user content, user engaged content. Um, and so some of that, thankfully, uh, we'd already gotten processes and personnel and talent, everyone involved ready for things like that. Well, that accelerated because um, that's, I actually think that that bucket of content actually didn't change and and now is for the good evidence by a place like TikTok. Um, so we had a bit of a uh, fortunate pivot already that allowed to accelerate. The third, we had to be creative. <laughs> I think yeah. we had brackets around sneakers. We had brackets around um, um, prior to, you know, prior to, we had brackets around great players and great teams. And and we tied those into TV. Um, I mean, we we're searching. Um, the uh, and then the fourth, which is less a content um, element, but more a a format. We figured out really quickly, and the team was really good at this. How do you produce thousands of hours of content virtually? Uh, and so you saw very quickly. We were able to do shows in real time live via Zoom and unique backgrounds and tapping into cell phones. And is it as beautiful as it was? Uh, no. Are there things that are better about it? Yes. Uh, did it allow us to get live really fast? Yes. And that was the most important part. So we shifted some of the content formats. Yeah. But we we kept creating. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned TikTok. We we've. We've been focusing quite a bit on that. We welcomed, uh, for one of these chats, we had Harish Sarma, who's a Tuck alum and heads partnerships over at, yeah. at uh, TikTok. Um, ESPN was pretty early kind of in the TikTok space. What did you learn from that? Um, and can you, you know, what was that decision like? I think you may have, were, were likely involved, obviously, in, in driving that decision. What was it like to say, okay, how do you evaluate a new platform like TikTok um, and then, say, yeah, this is how we made that decision. And, and this is what we've learned. Um, so a couple of things. One, I generally believe you should try everything and you should test the hell out of it and just, and determine whether or not, you know, it, but, but have a very real discussion after you've done that. Did I put my best foot forward? What did it look like? Uh, it's certainly not going to be perfect. So do we think this can be big or not doing this? Oftentimes big means uh, you get big before you make a lot of money. So you have to understand that. Um, and if it's not working, understand, was that my fault? Was that the team, like we weren't equipped properly or is it just not working? Um, so we went into that effort and, and Nick was measuring it from day one saying, what are we measuring for? What's our KPI? And we had, um, a small but dedicated team just cranking. And, and so my advice on that is like, the woman who was running that is fantastic at it. She knows the plat like, to be really good at these platforms or these, you need to live them. And I really firmly believe, um, you know, if you look at what we do on snap or, or what ESPN does, what we did on snap, um, it looked unlike anything else ESPN does. And I, that's why I think it was successful. Um, it was made for Snap, and it, it was not just cropped and reformatted um, because it's a different audience, a different tool set. Same thing with TikTok. Um, and uh, once we proved out that case, uh, look, it's a whole lot easier to um, rationalize resourcing to get support to, uh, uh, um, to grow something when you have proof that adding more people to it. That's how we, that's how we grew TikTok. That's how we grew the YouTube effort and business. That's how we grew our live streaming. They all started as someone's time, you know, half time, full time, and then saying, all right, well, if we got serious about this, if you added five people, if you added 12 people, what's this look like? Um, but 
you know, that's the kind of stuff Nick measured um, and that team measured and helped to resource because of definition of success. Yeah, Nick, why don't you uh, step in? For those that don't know Nick, for especially for our alumni, so Nick is one of our associates in the Center for Digital Strategies and, and worked uh, with Ryan at ESPN prior to coming to Tuck. Nick, thanks for joining. Awesome, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we are, we've got plenty of uh, audience questions starting to come in and I think we'll kind of get to those. For those that are on the line that want to ask a question, the, there's a Q&A pod at the bottom of the, of the Zoom console. Just if you click on that, you can go ahead and type your question in and we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can here. Uh, but Nick, you know, wanted to kind of introduce you and, and let you kind of say hello to everyone. Yeah, awesome. I guess I could kick it off with a, a question. Yeah. You kind of mentioned, Ryan, throughout this talk, kind of the importance of data and measuring and being able to kind of make decisions off of that, kind of pointing that to that MGM, I'm sure there's just a ton of data. How do you kind of integrate both the consumer data as well as kind of all of the data from leagues and kind of about the games and how does that kind of fit? Um, so it's... It's complicated. Um, there's obviously like specific data, right? What powers the games? The we do a lot of live betting now. Uh, I actually think it's a fantastic experience, um, uh, and a lot of that's done by a trading desk and uh, with data that comes in from other areas as well. Um, then there's data that informs marketing. So unlike what we did at ESPN, um, there's a lot of you know, arithmetic and, and science behind user acquisition and funneling and conversions. Um, and I don't mean that as a slight to ESPN, but that's not, ESPN is not, um, you know, the funnel is just different. The definition of conversion is different. Um, and so that is, I think, an opportunity to be really scientific and smart. Um, uh, it's also complicated uh, due to scales, geographies, all sorts of different things. As Nick knows in sports, one of the great complications and what we what we wrestled with at ESPN all the time was normalizing data is immensely complicated because there is a calendar uh, that changes. There is there are factors that change viewership or interest or in our cases maybe gameplay. Um, those can be day of week matchup. Was it you know did people leave the Baylor? Gonzaga game because it looked like a blowout just before halftime. Those things matter a great deal. Uh, you know, we had Monday Night Football go up against uh, presidential debates. The right, how do you make sense of that in that moment versus in the future? Really complicated. Um, the fun part is when you have transactional side to it, which we didn't, you know, which was a component of ESPN, but not on a pure content experience, not necessarily uh, uh, a, a KPI or depends what it was, um, but it's a factor. Here, you do have a value potential to create around a pixel. Um, and that is a bit clarifying um, and uh, you know would have solved some of the discussions we would have every day, Nick, as an example. Yeah. Awesome. So there's a, a question uh, from a first year Tuck student, Monique, who asks uh, about your time at ESPN and whether you noticed um, if there were any women's teams that were starting to rise about viewership over men's teams. I would, I would imagine one might be the women's national team on soccer side, for example. So soccer was always enormous. Um, the, um, I, I think, I mean, if you look at the, the college basketball tournament, it was spectacular. Um, and, um, it was a shame that some of those games were head to head. Like I watched the, uh, the Baylor UConn game, um, and to turn off was, were they going against the Baylor men? Was it, was that who was playing at that time against Oregon state? I forget who, but that was the best game of the tournament. Um, maybe UCLA Gonzaga was, was up there, but like, those are two fantastic games. Um, there were some surprising ones, I, um, I think, uh, or surprising to me, um, sports like softball, enormous following, particularly in the NCAA and uh, teams like Auburn, if I'm getting it correct, had big, big, big followings and uh, the fan bases, it was really good TV. Um, 
So the, the other part is, um, I just mentioned a bunch of team sports. It's different actually when you get to individual sports, tennis, uh, um, some of the biggest stars in the world. Um, like I, I think talent is over or supersedes gender uh, there. And we had a newish product where you could not just follow a team, but follow an athlete. And I thought, and that was really fascinating as well. Yeah. Do you see that kind of continuing to grow as, is more programming f- focusing more on women's sports in the space? I think, I think a bunch of, first of all, yes, I think it continues to grow. I think there are a bunch of factors into that. Some of it's programming. Some of it is um, new avenues to reach fans that aren't so reliant necessarily on the programming, mm-hmm. um, which I think is a good thing. Um, I think also you go back to my, the users in charge. Well, now, like I'm a huge swim fan. I, I swam at Duke. My kids are big swimmers. Uh, there's like, I will watch every, well, guess what? Like, I can watch every hour stream now across ACC's, NCAA's. Today there's a a pro swim tournament. Um, I can find what I like and it's available. And it's not just, you know, 10 years ago, I would have to say it's not on TV because they decided to lead with X. Um, And I think that's going to reveal user habits that are actually pretty, uh, pretty powerful. Um, So I think it's, and then you look at, again, look at the recent NCAA tournaments. Um, there were really good stories to be told as to results and interest and quality of gameplay that I think are also going to be important going forward. Yeah, it's it's interesting. My experience this winter was very similar. We, I grew up a ski racer and not a lot on TV. You know, you have to kind of find the package and the, and to get the Olympics channel, and then sometimes it's on, but it's not on replay. But to be able to 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 uh, you know, P, I think Peacock this year did a really good job with some of those Olympic sports. I think they've really kind of cornered that Olympic sport kind of market um, was really, really interesting. I, you know, I probably watched more than I have in my entire life this winter with fewer t- opportunities to not, to be out right. of the world. Yeah, and require, with it. Like the worry with those generally are, um, are you speaking to the audience you were speaking to anyway? So my example of yeah. expand your audience becomes harder. And uh, yes, you still need the main streams and that has to be solved for all of these to be elevated. Um, but the availability of it is step one, when people tune in and watch and there's data and, and, and so forth around that, that helps elevate and make the other cases. Um, so look, what, what I, what I love to turn on the TV and on certain channels and see certain things. Yes. Um, I do think when consumers make choices, it also starts to drive that change and, yeah. and, uh, and again, power the user. Yeah. Um, there's a, a good question from Carly, a student we work with in the center as well. Um, she asks about, you know, starting remote at a new company. Uh, you know, many of our students are about to do that, whether it's for their summer internship or their full, full-time roles leaving Tuck. You know, what have you learned? How did you connect with the team as a senior leader, as a COO? I mean, you're kind of overseeing the entire company. Um, you know, how have you made those connections and hit the ground running? What have you learned that maybe you might be able to share with our students? It's really hard. Um, it's really hard. Uh, and so I'm not saying anything novel there, but uh, I, I do think recognizing that it is hard and what it is not good at will help you acclimate a bit. Um, like my, my number one advice when you go back to work and you're in person is fill your time up as long as you're still doing your work and so forth, but fill time up having coffees, like just go meet people, whether it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, you need to build relationships. And also like some of that selfish, right? Like, but they're going to need you as well, but it also exposes you to different parts of the business and different, uh, people's incentive structures. I don't mean financial, but like how someone thinks about their day to day, no company succeeds without the parts all connecting. Um, and so when life does get back to normal, just reach out. You saw someone, they said something smart in a meeting. Hey, I'd like to take you to coffee. Um, and, and, then do that quarterly or monthly or whatever that is for that person. When you end a meeting and you met someone said, Hey, I thought that was interesting. Any, like, can you name a person for me to follow up with? Um, 
I say that because I think that is really critical. And the question in this world is how do you replicate that? Because I think what this is really good at is um, what I think this is really good at is efficiency. What it's really bad at are the flybys and the kind of random interactions. Um, and so the example of, hey, I'm just gonna call this person out of the blue without a scheduled time and say, hey, like, how's it going? It, it feels, it, it feels wasteful sometimes to the recipient. I don't, I don't it, that's not right, but that is kind of how it feels sometimes. Um, and so I just encourage you to think about as you start how to allocate a bunch of time. They can be 15 minutes, they don't need, but to set up meetings that are purely for the point of having a discussion and learning and not driven by a transaction of work. Yeah. And that will feel really weird but it's really important. It, it's, it's great advice. I think it's something that, you know, we've both felt that pain of not being able to just like have that stop by, say hi, build that relationship. And I think, you know, one of the things I would, I would echo for what you said, it, it seems as though the payoff is long, it, the, because the payoff is long in the long run, not in the short run. You know, when you're first starting out, it can be really hard to kind of prioritize that over getting up to speed and getting, you know, but it's, it's the, it's, it's really important to build those relationships and to be able to kind of um, learn and connect and, 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 and network with other folks and, and start to like see their perspective and, and, and make sure that they know yours. And, and it's great advice. I also think when the world returns, it will make things less awkward. Uh, that feels soft, but like you're going to show up and you're going to be part of an organization. It's going to look different that day than it did when you started. And the, if there is a single most important thing in career, in my opinion, it is make a bunch of relationships that are not formed on transactional needs, right? Like if, if, if Nick and I didn't spend time over years actually having some relationship or trading an email saying, I, like I sent him a note, said, how you doing? How's, how's tough? What do you think about what's next? If at, the only time I heard from Nick was when he needs something or him from me when I need something, and I have countless examples, then it's not really a relationship. It's, it's transparent what it is. Um, and there are so many people who came to ESPN through literally decade old relationships and different work patterns that I had over the years. Now, by the way, into bed MGM. Um, and I got to bed MGM in part due to some relationships like that. It, you got those relationships have to, you know, have to be long term minded to have uh, uh, to be reciprocated. Yeah. One of those relationships being the new hire uh, you guys just announced with uh, Jared coming from Disney to be the chief product officer. What do you guys see as kind of the, the roadmap from a product perspective kind of moving forward, especially as you try to compete with a lot of players in the space? Uh, so a couple things. Um, uh, yeah, so, so we hired a new, uh, head of product, uh, chief product officer last week. Um, uh, he came from Disney ESPN before that we worked together at eBay, actually swam together at Duke. Um, the, um, so a couple things. One, we think a lot about getting into markets and market access and the speed of that. And for all the reasons you outlined with earlier questions, it's complicated. It's complicated uh, for a bunch of setups. It's complicated for security. It's comp all sorts of things. Hard, really, 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 really critical. Um, so one is get to location, do it properly. Simplify the product. Um, I mean, this will sound like the kind of stuff we thought about at ESPN. Simplify the product. Uh, there, it offers an amazing assortment of actions and capabilities the hardest part of any product job is always how do you make that easy? And also the next one, how do you make that beautiful? Um, and I like it all the time when you walk into the Bellagio, you immediately know what the Bellagio stands for and you smile. You walk into the MGM, you immediately recognize it's different and you smile and it, and it means something else to you. Uh, we need to give that same kind of feeling when you're using us. Um, I think there's a lot of mechanics around just how to be smarter. Um, and 
we're the largest uh, in the nation in, in iGaming um, uh, and growing crazy fast. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to do some really innovative work there as well. So not just on the sports side, different ways to present games, different ways to create gameplay, et cetera. So there's a, um, a good question about kind of the changes that the economic changes to the sports leagues themselves and sort of whether that is likely to lead to more aggressive acceptance of, of and deployment of sports betting. Do you see that COVID sort of as an accelerant for, for this, uh, you know, as combined with maybe the sports leagues themselves being more amenable? Um, I, I mean, you'd have to ask those guests, I would say. Uh, I do believe, again, think back to my answer to, uh, you know, my, my, I guess, uh, dancing answer to your, where's the future head for some of this stuff. If you take the fans perspective, I do think if you take the fans perspective here and you take the league's perspective as to potential for deeper engagement, different ways of fandom, uh, potential revenue opportunities, I think it's healthy, uh, and aligned. I think aligned is an important word where all these things work that, uh, it's a good thing for the user, a good thing for the partner, a good thing for the platform, good thing for the, in this, that case, the rights holder or the team or the league. Um, you know, did COVID spark some of that discussion faster than it would have? Who knows? Maybe. Um, but I think the fact that there is alignment around those as potential outcomes is generally uh, means that the direction uh, um, would make sense. Um, what are some of the roadblocks for you? I mean, you're, you know, running operations, right? Overseeing all the operations for BetMGM. What are some of the things that you're kind of excited or maybe even dreading, but, ta you know, on your kind of top of your to-do list to, to enable both the growth and, and continue maturation of the, of BetMGM? Uh, I mean, we think a lot about the product experience. We think a lot about rolling out and access. I think a lot about um, just how to delight the user and some of that might end up in customer service components uh, or easier conversion process. Uh, we're growing fast and growth also means, you know, you have to think about organization and personnel and, um, you know, so hiring someone like Jared is, uh, you know, that was a thoughtful exercise uh, and it's also an important exercise and an important outcome. Uh, and so there's a lot of personal growth and personnel growth as well. Um, you know, back to kind of career advice and something I remind myself every day is um, approach the things that, you know, you want to improve or you think need improving or you're um, or it can be frustrating. That might be process, might be an outcome, whatever it is. Um, approach them from the other side, which is saying that's the upside. Um, so we're seeing re remarkable growth and we're the leader in uh, uh, iGaming. We're growing fast and, and approaching the top in sports and so forth. And I think we have ways that we can, like clear, tangible, identifiable ways that we can be better. Uh, and to me, that's very freeing and exciting as opposed to the flip side, which is, you know, in any job, you're going to have frustrations in any process, you're going to find ways that need improvement. Um, and I'm excited by that. And, and there's a lot of that. There's a lot to do. Is this, is this a space? So, so there's sort of this technology combined with the sports and digital, you know, sports and bet, betting part to your business. Um, historically on the, on the, the gaming side or the, or the, the sports betting side, there's been a multiple players, you know, location based, you know, in the U S at least out, out in primarily in Vegas. Um, but in tech, there tends to be this much more consolidation over rapid consolidation that happens. Like, do you see kind of those as competing, you know, interests for you? Do you see that something as, Hey, this is probably going to look a lot more like a technology company than a kind of traditional coming from that hospitality and, and, you know, gaming side. How do you think about that? Kind so, of so I'm going to straddle, both, right? I'm going to give you an answer. Yeah. That, that's my answer is straddling, which is, yeah. I think what wins here is the best experience, uh, um, which is a definition of a whole bunch of things. 
uh, from the marketing to the product, to the brand, to the, you know, the environment you create, to the rewards, whatever all that might be. Um, and, um, and that's how it's delivered is also the technology side. So it's tech, it's marketing, it's, it's the experience of it. Uh, it's also the integration back to physical. Um, and I do think like a lot of things, uh, there'll be multiple players, uh, who succeed there. Um, there's multiple players succeeding right now. Um, but the question for all, back to the question I started with that we asked ourselves at ESPN, what can we do that no one else can do? How do we, uh, drive experience and satisfaction in ways that no one else can? What's, what's our superpower, which is, you know, a question you'll probably get in any interview. What's your superpower? Uh, and I think we need to constantly drive by that as opposed to by, um, you know, how did market share look specifically last week, month before? Yeah. So when you enter, there's a question also about sort of the entering new markets, so to speak, you know, entering a new state kind of moves into this space and less about the legal side, but more on an operation side. Like, is that a significant challenge that you have to kind of set up a whole separate kind of operation in each state then I would assume? Every state's different. Um, but yes, it's it's not flip uh, uh, an A B uh, button on a on a settings page of the app, uh, and, and in some cases, like a state like Michigan, uh, MGM's has a fantastic big presence uh, with you know a beautiful casino in downtown Detroit, and we have a relationship with the Lions and the Tigers now, and. Um, so there's also the part of it, not just the how's it set up, but how is um, how do we leverage our relationships? How do we uh, join in with those partners? How do we uh, do it alongside them? What's our marketing strategy? What's our presence? Uh, uh, so it, it, everything's like very specific geo by geo. And uh, um, but yes, it's it's not flipping a switch. Yeah. Um, yeah, Nick, feel free to jump in too if you have other questions that you'd like to. I think there's some more coming in. It's a question around European or, or non-US market sort of expansion and how you think about that. And obviously that significant different space and some of those have been, been more open spaces for a while. How do you think about sort of non-US? Yes, uh, so, so I talked about our, um, you know, our parents, if you will. Uh, Intain is, a tremendously successful uh, uh, platform provider um, in all those markets. And so um, that runs through Intain and, and where we can support, fantastic. Uh, but, um, you know, that MGM is US uh, and, um, and Intain is, you know, a terrifically successful company. Um, there's another, yeah, go ahead, Nick, jump in. Go ahead. I was just going to say thank you for coming, Ryan. Yeah, this, <laughs> this has is... been awesome. It's super cool. Yeah, this really is. really appreciate uh, you taking the time. It's a really interesting space, Ryan. And, and you know, I think your, your insight, both coming from ESPN as well as now in your new role, has been really, really helpful for me and for, I know, for the audience on the, on the call to better understand it. And, and I think, you know, as well as just your insights and kind of managing through transitions, right now which is well, that's right. there will always be a lot yeah, yeah always be you know, change. the only um, constant is change right it, yeah. yeah and i'll do my uh, I'll, I'll do my sales pitch which is you know when the time's right for folks uh, as you think about career whether it's advice or interest in bed mgm or the space please uh it's such a dynamic place it's such a dynamic space and i i think i i multiple times have said a year ago we were we were a fourth, a fifth of the size, um, just for perspective. And, and that's people, the business is actually grown <laughs> multiples more than that. Um, yeah. so, uh, please reach out. Uh, would love to talk, give advice, um, or, uh, or explore ideas. That sounds wonderful. And when we're able to be back in person, we'll have to get you up to beautiful Hanover for a visit. Sounds great. Look forward awesome. to it. Thanks All again, right. Ryan. Really appreciate him. You know, really appreciate your time today and best Thank of luck in the new job. Thanks. All right. Bye.